Hey, happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine. Uh, I think it's week 23, I'm not really sure. I was on vacation, so you gotta give me a break. It takes me a while to get back into uh, work mode. But I had to get back in time for, of course, uh, a hurricane, because it's not bad enough we're living through a global pandemic. We have to have a hurricane as well, just to show, you know, we're tough Texans. Uh, by the way, what happened to Marco? I mean, I've been waiting all week for Marco to show up, and Marco's nothing. So anybody named Marco ought to, like, protest and call the Weather Bureau and say, look, you got to use Marco next year, because Marco did not show up. But Laura looks like it just went uh, east of us. Uh, and my sister, who, as I've told you, lives in New York, has no clue about what that means, but that's a good thing if they're east, because that means all the wet weather uh, goes to the east of us. Low pressure is cir uh, circulate counterclockwise, so all the bad weather is on the east side of the storm. Folks in the northeast don't know that because they're used to nor'easters in the winter where the low pressure is off of the Atlantic coast and they get these big uh, storms coming from the north. So they think that being on that side of the low pressure is good or is bad, but in Houston it's, it's good. So we had, a, we had a close call, but the good news is uh, we are doing okay. A uh, couple of things that came up through the questions, uh, interestingly enough, uh, I remember the, I, my executive had asked me about sports and which sports you could participate and I had mentioned tennis was good. Well, somebody wrote in and said, reminded me that cricket was also probably pretty good, although uh, based on the MLB uh, experience, I'm not sure it's the spacing on the field versus being in a team room or being out in the community that counts because I guess golf works also as well. Um, and then the other thing, as I mentioned, I, I really didn't know what to do about colleges, and I thought it was a giant experiment. Well, the experiment has happened, and it has been a failure. So the uh, University of North Carolina and Notre Dame opened up we have, with hope as their strategy, and as I mentioned, hope is not a great strategy, uh, and almost immediately had to close. And now what do you do? Now you've got a bunch of infected kids. Uh, it's interesting to think about that for colleges or universities who are thinking about what to do with their students who are positive, probably the last thing you want to do is send them back home to their community. So uh, it's an interesting dilemma, uh, still no uh, real good solution to that. I also got uh, uh, some uh, interesting questions. Somebody asked, well, why am I saying uh, less than 200 cases is, the, you know, is reasonable um, and am I just setting a standard that is absolutely too high to achieve? and therefore we will never open up. And I remind uh, folks that early on in the uh, pandemic, our local epidemic, we were at 200 cases and it wasn't until we had uh, Memorial Day and then July 4th that we got up to this above 1,000 cases. First and foremost, uh, we talked to our public health officials to decide how many uh, cases they can actually contact trace. So what we're talking about is going from the mitigation strategy with blunt instrument, close things, uh, shut down businesses, close schools, to a containment strategy where we're sort of functioning normally again. But when there is a positive case, we can identify the case, we can test them. If they're positive, we put them in quarantine and we can find out all of their contacts that are significant and either quarantine them or trace uh, or test them as well. That number turns out to be about 200 that the public health department feels they can manage. Now, if you look at 200 per 5 million Houstonians, that's about four, four or five cases per 100,000. And that is what other countries are trying to shoot for, 10 to 100,000, 10, 10 in 100,000 is kind of the level at which you can really do a containment strategy rather than mitigation. So that was where the 200 cases uh, came. Uh, one person uh, ob objected, and re reasonably so, to uh, my comment about uh, avoiding uh, religious services that had large numbers of gatherings and pointed out in their church that they had taken a lot of precautions, all of which sounded absolutely excellent. Uh, masking, distancing, um, making sure people had reservations, all that is all very good. And I just remind people that when I say what my opinion is, uh, it is my opinion, based on the science, uh, and what I was answering is would I go to a religious service, and I still would stay out of any groups that were larger than 10 or 12 people. Uh, what, what would be, if I were 
advising a church, I'd want to look at things like ventilation. Do you have HEPA filtration? Do you have UVC in the ceiling? There are all kinds of things. And, and the, the thing about an aggregation of people doesn't mean you're absolutely going to have an outbreak. But if somebody is a high spreader and you put people together, you are going to put a lot of people at risk. So it's, and, and the person that sent it in said, I should say, it depends on the institution. And I'm willing to agree to that. It depends on uh, the rigor in which they're doing it because, you know, there is not an absolute in this world. And I think around a lot of this is just common sense, but also you have to distinguish the science from policy. Uh, if you're setting policies because people don't follow rules, you'll say things like, you'll create a policy that says you cannot have more than 10, 10 to 20 people in a, in a con congregant setting. That might be a policy, but you know that on an individual basis, uh, you could probably do it safely if you did all the things that were required. That said, I'm not a policymaker. I'm just trying to provide the science. I will tell you, I was disappointed today. I was walking Lily this morning, and there's a little tiny Quonset hut uh, for a gym uh, that's on uh, North Boulevard. I don't know what the name of it is, but I saw about 20 people wearing masks going into this contained space to exercise. And I'm just thinking, like, what are you people thinking? I mean, it just makes absolutely no sense in the world. Anyway. So that's some of the answers to the comments from last week. Uh, it's been a good week in terms of our, our COVID experience. Uh, looking at the three metrics that I talk about all the time, our R value now has been under one for over two weeks. That's really good. That means we're winning and, the, the, and all the metrics, almost all the metrics show that. Our daily case number has been under 2,000. It's been jumping between 1,000 and 1,500. That's still nowhere near where we need to be. As I said, I think we need to be around 200 cases. That number, again, is based on how we can go to mitigation of containment. And our test positivity rate is running around 7%. We need to get that well under 5% before we really are in a position uh, to, to do what we need to do. Uh, I want to mention that uh, I, I told you I don't think we should follow hospital metrics, but because we are a medical center and we care about it, uh, our hospitalizations are down, that's a good thing. Our ICU admissions are down, that's a great thing. Uh, our mortality has uh, been sort of constant. Uh, case rate uh, mortality has been a around probably 1% if you calculate it. Um, and that, that remains pretty, pretty constant. Uh, there's been some really kind of cool uh, new developments in the last couple of weeks. Uh, there was a really excellent uh, paper in Cell uh, that showed if you were infected with uh, COVID-19 or uh, SARS-2, um, you, your antibody levels may wane, but there's still uh, some T-cell uh, memory uh, immunity still around, and that's really important. And I, I, I know this is going to be painful to any immunologists out there, but for people to understand the importance of that, uh, you have to go back into the another trip through history into the 60s when uh, the importance of T and B cell immunity really was established. T cells are called T cells because they are derived from the thymus uh, and B cells are called B cells because they come from bone marrow. And there were some really uh, terrific, uh, very simple studies done in the 60s that showed that both T and B cells are required to develop immunity against the foreign antigen and it was done in mice in the foreign antigen with uh, sheep red blood cells. And so though they're very important uh, communicators. So uh, when a, a T cell uh, in encounters another cell that's presenting a foreign an antigen like a virus, uh, it gets educated and it recognizes it. And uh, it finds a B cell and you know, when the two of them interact, it tells the B cell that it's encountered this foreign antigen. And then the, the B cell starts proliferating and it differentiates into a plasma cell that makes antibodies. And that B cell makes the antibodies, it's a plasma cell that makes the antibodies that go ahead and kill off the virus. Well, the level of antibody that we follow is important and it may wane in time. And, and there are examples of that. You know, you get, you've all had a, a tetanus shot when you were a kid. Well, you had to get a booster every 10 years because the antibodies to that wane you continue to have memory for that, so when you get uh, another vaccination against tetanus, you get a big immune response. 
Well, it could be something like that that happens with some of the coronaviruses, that there's a, a waning immunity from the, the, the antibodies, but as long as you have that memory T cell there, that's a very good sign, and it means that likely if you're rechallenged with the virus, you might uh, uh, have a, like a booster response. And so, you, you know, this, it, it's very interesting to think about because there was also a report of one patient in Hong Kong that supposedly got a second infection. Well, that's one patient worldwide that we've identified, and I haven't seen the actual sequence, but they reported that the sequences of the two viruses were different, suggesting that it really was truly a second infection. Well, uh, that may be true, but the patient was also asymptomatic. And so it might be that if that patient's uh, antibody response wanes, but he has memory and is infected again, uh, it gets enough of a response to at least prevent symptoms and maybe prevent transmission. So those are, those are really important steps in understanding the immunity to, uh, uh, to this particular uh, virus. And it's, I think it's, it's interesting to watch how, we, uh, how, how all this is taking place. Uh, one of the important things is that another person asked, well, what's the outlook in the fall, you know, for example? Well, it's really interesting to speculate. You know, we've never gone into a flu season where um, we sort of have social distancing in place in, in, in response to coronavirus. So my guess is, despite, I'm, I'm hoping everybody gets vaccinated against the flu, but because of this, the, the public health measures we're doing around coronavirus, my guess is we'll have a milder flu season than everyone's predicting. Everyone's predicting a very serious flu season, but you know, the subways aren't packed in New York. We're not, we're social distancing where we can. Those are all the same things that mitigate against flu. And then someone was asking uh, again, well, what do you think is gonna be the long-term outlook with, uh, with, the, with the coronavirus, much like when is this is gonna be over? Uh, but it's actually interesting to think about because uh, if we get a, even a partially effective vaccine, uh, that will be very, very helpful in, 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 in getting to what's called herd immunity. Uh, if we can get to that place, then it is likely that this will wane in time. Uh, it will be worldwide for sure because we're not going to get vaccines to everybody. And, and there's a bunch of coronaviruses out there that we have not generally been vaccinating against. My guess is a year from it now or a year and a half from now, uh, we will likely have the same kind of panel of experts that we have for flu. So we have a group of scientists that get together, they look at all the flu variants in, uh, that are in, the, in all the markets in, in the East, and then they try to come up with what are the, the, the number of flu strains we have to vaccinate against. They come up with a multivalent vaccine, usually against two or three strains, a couple A, a couple B strains. My guess is we'll have the same thing for coronaviruses. We'll probably have a multivalent coronavirus vaccine that we all get at the same time we get the flu vaccine, and that that will be kind of the new steady state that we are in this uh, over a long period of time with the many, many variants of coronaviruses that exist. So that's, that's my guess of, of, of what's going to happen uh, over time. Uh, this, the last thing is that there's been a, a lot of uh, focus on the new point of care test. Uh, these are antigen capture tests. And think of a, a pregnancy test where uh, you dip it in a buffer and it changes color. It's kind of the same idea. Uh, you have to have an antibody that's linked to an enzyme that, change, that induces a change in color in a buffer. Uh, and that, you have a strip, and on that strip is the antibody, and hopefully the antibody is good enough to detect SARS-CoV-2, not COVID-1, not uh, MERS or any other coronavirus, and if it's specific enough, uh, and to identify you, then you can swab it in your mouth or in your nose by yourself, put it in a buffer, and it'll change color. Uh, that is likely going to be uh, starting to be available, and I think that'll be very helpful for us you know, in terms of managing students and managing colleges, because those can be done almost daily or every other day. They're not that great, they're not that sensitive, but you know, when w there's two different kinds of, of testing. When we do a test, a QPCR test, when you come to our laboratory or your, our uh, hospital or clinic, we stick a swab up your nose, put it in buffer, we send it to the lab, we do a PCR, very sensitive, very specific. 
That's a diagnostic test. When you leave, you know you had it or you didn't have it. What we kind of need for managing large populations like students uh, is more of a screening test, which isn't necessarily that great. It might be lower sensitivity, for example. It may not get everyone. But if you're doing it multiple times, you can actually effectively screen for outbreaks. So just for example, if, if uh, you have 10 people and you have a, sense, a test that's only 50% sensitive, we would never allow that to be used as a diagnostic. 50-50 doesn't work. But it would identify five out of 10 people, and then if you took the same 10 people and, and did it the second day, the five that it didn't identify would be down to two and a half, and then by the third day, it'd be down to about one person. Well, 90% sensitivity is what we want for our diagnostic tests. You don't want to do three diagnostic tests to get to an answer. But if you're screening large numbers of people and they're doing it daily or every other day, you can afford to have a lower sensitivity because eventually you will pick up those people that are positive and, and that's a way to manage it. So I think the antigen capture uh, assays that are being developed now will be very helpful for us in managing schools and that kind of thing, colleges and, 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 and captive populations. Uh, so I'm pretty excited about that development and there's uh, that's largely to start. That's largely going to be available, I would think, in the next several several months. Uh, so that's a, the, that's pretty much everything I wanted to talk about this week. Uh, one person did ask me again about uh, airline travel. Uh, I am uh, particularly nervous about airline travel, commercial travel, uh, only because you're in a tube <laughs> with a lot of people for a long period of time, but. Many of the airlines are using HEPA filtration. Uh, there has not been yet a documented outbreak on a commercial airline, but I'm not traveling on commercial airlines yet. And as I said before, I, a couple, last week or a couple weeks ago, some of the airlines are really trying to do this very responsibly and some are not. So uh, I think airline travel, in, and we're not, at Baylor College of Medicine, we are still not uh, recommending commercial travel for any uh, official business. So anyway, it's been a, a really good week for us uh, in the community. We've escaped uh, a harrowing uh, hurricane. Uh, we're still doing all the work of, that uh, is Baylor College of Medicine. And I, I'm really proud of the things that we're doing to help the schools. We were on a bunch of uh, calls with the county and the city trying to help them uh, uh, around the school advice. Nancy Marino's working on uh, curriculum development for kids all ages to understand public health. So Baylor College of Medicine is right in the middle of doing everything we can to support our community, uh, the nation, and the world. So thank you all. It's all of your work. It's you who do this. It's not me. It's all of you who do it. So thank you for being part of Baylor College of Medicine and have a great weekend and I'll see you next week. Bye-bye.